All right, welcome in. We continue to keep it rolling here on Inside the Cage. Although the uh, status of fights are up in the air, we're still talking to all fighters. Uh, I am Mike Pendleton. You can follow me on Twitter at MP2310. And my next guest here, we probably got a lot to talk about. As you guys know, try to bring you guys the story of these fighters, not just talk fights with them. And uh, this is somebody I'm happy to say I've known for a little while now, and uh, I would consider him a friend. Um, hopefully he would consider me a friend. But uh, looking to make a statement, moving down to featherweight, he is the only one and only, excuse me, Jared Flash Gordon. What's going on, Jared? Nothing much, man. I'm doing all right. Just, you know, trying to uh, get by during this weird time. Now, you've gone through some crazy, some tragic, some wild things in your life. Where does the coronavirus pandemic rank in order of, of, of situations you, you've had to get through? Because I, I know as a fighter, it's, it's obviously very challenging. But, I mean, I'm barely stepping out of the house these days. I'm not working, you know, and I'm obviously not a fighter. But where would you rank this pandemic? I mean pretty serious obviously we've never seen anything like this in our lifetime um but like personally right now i would say it's actually at first it didn't seem that scary but now um for me it is because my family and where i grew up uh my immediate family and my extended family members and all my friends live in like the epicenter in uh, Queens, New York of this pandemic in the United States. So it's pretty scary. Uh, a lot of people around me, a lot of people that I know are sick. Some people have died. So uh, it's definitely really scary right now. Uh, I seem to be pretty healthy. My family seems to be healthy. So um we're good right now, but it's really scary because, you know, we're they're all surrounded by it. I mean, I live in Florida, so, but even the air, area that I'm in in Florida is turning into a hotbed for, for the virus because of uh, the main hubs that are here in Miami. I'm just north of Miami, Fort Lauderdale, so it's pretty scary, man, you know, and uh, by the time it's over, I feel like we're all going to know someone that was uh, affected by this or even ourselves be, you know, infected or affected some way or another. So it's pretty scary. It absolutely is. And uh, I, I do want to send, you know, the best to your family and friends and those around you um, because obviously I'm here in Jersey now. So, you know, there are people back in Chicago I'm originally from who are like, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy over here. But they make it sound like a war zone over there. And, and it really is. Um, so I send you all my best uh, for that. But you mentioned that you're in Florida now. Let's get into Jared Gordon here. When did you make the move to Florida, and are you there uh, full-time, 24-7 now? Yeah, I'm here uh, 24-7, 365. I got here about – I got here in December full-time after my last fight. Um, I decided to come here full-time because my – Fiance lives here, and uh, I was just spreading myself thin, like traveling to Milwaukee, and uh, I was spending. You know, I had two apartments, so I was paying rent in two different places. So this is just easier. I'm with my fiance, so that's better. Um, and I'm training at Henry Hooks Gym, so it's been cool. I like it a lot. Um, I left Rufus Sport on really good terms. I love everyone over there. Duke, uh, all the other coaches and all my teammates, you know, they understand why I made the move. And uh, so it's been good, man. And I'm, I'm enjoying my time here. It's, you know, it's always warm. It's like 89 degrees right now. I'm so jealous. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so that's been good. And, you know, it's just been easier for me as far as financially and, um, you know, everything's in one place, so I don't have to travel and go crazy training and 
you know, trying to keep my relationship with my fiance intact. So it's been good. Well, obviously making moves uh, for the better is what everyone (laughs) strives to do. Um, But for your personal life and your professional life, it it sounds like you've, you've made the right move. Now, this is going to be the question. This is going to be the only question where all of Twitter needs an answer. You just talked about keeping the relationship strong with your fiance. Does this move make you have to keep this relationship with Bilal Muhammad strong as well? Like how is, what, what is happening between you two? It's been really tough for me and Bilal, you know, we're separated uh, a couple, you know, like 1,500 miles, uh, but uh, we speak like almost every day and, you know, my fiance and, you know, his, uh, his girl, you know, they know who, you know, comes first and obviously Bilal comes first and for, I think, you know, for, for him, I come first. <laughs> so, uh. <laughs> We've been all right. Uh, we're, we're, we're making do. Now, do you feel loved when he's making the, the videos and he's putting your face all over the apartment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes me feel, you know, like a, like a miss, you know, and and how, um, how uh, you know, it used to be for us. We're always together, you know. So, um, but uh, it's been good, man. Uh he knows I love him, and I know he loves me, so we're we're doing all right. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, <clears throat> on a more serious note, I, I think a lot of people know your story, and I once asked this earlier when we were talking about it, but uh, with the coronavirus pandemic, and you said you're down in Florida, we saw early on when this thing started to come to uh, the U.S. that a lot of people, especially young people, especially young people in Florida, they didn't give a damn. And, uh, you know, you've been there to preach messages about making uh, better life decisions for many people based off, you know, your personal story. When you see something like this and then you see 18-year-olds going, I don't care, it's my spring break, it's my birthday, like this coronavirus isn't going to get me, but if it gets me, it it gets me. Like, do you have a message to urge those, especially younger, to be like, hey, this isn't a joke and and it's more than about yourself? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, over the last couple of days, it, it's obviously gotten a lot more serious, and I think people are, like, finally taking it very seriously. So, I mean, you know, I would say just you got to, like, take the precautionary measures. Uh, you know, I was going out training and, expo- you know, risk- risking exposing myself and then coming home and exposing, you know, my fiancé and whoever else I come in contact with. Um, so even for me, I was kind of like, not that I, I, I took it seriously from the get go, but you know, I, you know, I signed a contract to fight May 16th. So I'm like, well, you know, I still got to train. So I was going out and training and, but my gyms have now, have now closed down for the next couple of weeks. They said, so I don't know what we're going to do, but, uh, I would say that you just kind of, you know, take the precautionary measures and do what the authorities are saying to do. And I'm not saying don't work out and don't, don't train, but you got to be careful, obviously. And, uh, you know, all those kids that were on spring break and drink, you know, they want to drink and have fun. I, I get it, you know. Um, but now I'm sure some of them are, are paying the price. But, yeah, I would say for everyone, just, you know, you gotta, we got to listen to the authorities and the professionals and, do what we can to keep each other safe. Speaking of that, you told a crazy story um, on social media. The police came in and shut down your gym? Like, how was that? Like, how'd that happen? Well, we were training in, so Fort Lauderdale and Miami were like one of the the first two cities in Florida to get, like, like as far as non-essential businesses to get shut down. So we were training in the gym uh, the first, uh, Hard Knocks 365, uh, one of the locations, one of our gym's locations is in Fort Lauderdale. So we were training in there, and I guess someone called the cops and said that we were in there working out. So they came in, and they said we have to leave. Uh, they were super nice about it. You know, this was, like, over a week ago, so, like, the, it was just starting to get serious. But, uh, yeah, they told us we had to leave, so, you know, we all got up and left and went to a park train but even now the i think 
I think the parks are even closed now. So, um, we got, uh, yeah, serious for sure, but they were super nice. The cops, they, they shut us down and that was it. We all left. And, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it seemed pretty, it was pretty crazy though when they came in because, you know, that kind of like showed us how serious it was, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Now, you did say you have a fight in May. You're, you're going to be taking on Matt Sales in San Diego. It's a two-part question here. Uh, you can answer in either order. I don't really care. Um, one, are you confident that that fight will take place? And two, what is it like training, and, and how are you getting your training in uh, during this time? Uh, so I'm definitely confident that it will happen at one point or another, but I'm not too confident that it will happen May 16th. Um, you know, the government officials are saying it's going to take like three or four more weeks for for this to like peak. So um, that's obviously a problem as far as training. You know, for me, my gyms are closed. I'm sure my opponent, who I believe lives in California, his gyms are probably closed too. I know California put in like a shelter in for the whole state. So, I mean, I'm sure he's getting workouts in on his own and, you know, with a couple of teammates, but it's not the same when, when you're not in the gym and you're not with your coaches and you can't strength train, you can't, you know, do all the essential things you have to do for to fight, you know, and have a proper camp. Plus, we have to cut weight. Um, so we got to, you know, constantly do cardio and diet properly. And so everything is compromised. Um, and then as far as, like, traveling, like, are we supposed to, like, are we really going to travel? I'm supposed to go from Florida to California to fight um, when I'm cutting weight. And, you know, I've been sick during weight cuts just from, you know, being low on energy. Um, you know, you're cutting weight. You're not eating as much as you should. Uh, you're working out. I've gotten sick, like, fight week just from cutting weight, let alone, like, a serious illness. So am I supposed to travel on a plane while I'm cutting weight in airports, major airports, while I'm, you know, it's, like, kind of scary, and, and we're definitely risking our health doing that. Um, so, you know, the, the UFC had already... Um, postpone those three events and every, it's all up in the air right now as far as where UFC 249 is going to take place we don't really know for sure if, you know they're saying it's going to happen but we don't know where or when um, and then what about all the shows after that like there's no there's been no word so I'm really not sure what to think um, I know my gyms are closed for the next few weeks so I'm not going to be training properly so am I supposed to take a fight without proper training? It's kind of unfair, obviously, for everyone, not just... It's unfair for, for the fighters. It's unfair for the, the fans. It's unfair for the UFC because guys aren't going to be, you know, performing at the level that they could be. Uh, people have to make weight. So, you know, I think... And I, and I know the UFC knows this, so... Um, Apparently, they're being really lenient about it, uh, according to my manager. Like, if you want to fight or if you want to pull out. I mean, that's what I heard. So, you know, and I know they are, they're all concerned as well as for, for their health and our health. Um, what was the other question? The other part of the question? Well, you answered answer? that. Is if you think you're going to – if it will happen, I think you kind of answer that. And then just how, I guess, you you know, you're adjusting to training. You also hit that. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so, like, I'm – I've been able to get training in, um, but now, so one of the other facilities that we're in was a medical facility, so they were able to stay open because they do, like, physical therapy there, but we just heard recently that they're definitely going to be closing, so now, so at first my training wasn't compromised, uh, even though we were doing it in smaller groups and limiting the amount of people that can come in, but now it's definitely compromised, so yeah, I'm definitely concerned. 
I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just playing it out. I'm still trying to, I'm still trying to stay uh, ready and get prepared. But I mean, it's definitely a huge issue. Have you had that conversation with your manager? You, you said they're being lenient. Has he asked you, and have you told him like, "Hey, look, you know, I want to fight, and you, what if it can happen in May? Is, is do you still want to fight?" So I told him like, "I'm I'm going to stay ready," and um, I was asking him like, "You know, has the UFC said anything?" And and he said that he hasn't really heard much, and um, but he did hear that like, you know, they they understand obviously the issue here and what's going on, so like. If you don't want to fight or if you want to, if you want to, you know, if you do want to fight, you know, it's up to us and they're being lenient about that. Um, but we're all in the same boat. You know, everybody's compromised right now. So it's not just like one state or, you know, one country, like the whole world is under siege right now. So, I mean, um, I think we're just have to let, you know, time play out to see what really happens. Yeah. I'm sure as it gets closer, hopefully there's a little bit more clarity. If, yeah. If it's not completely settled, um, but you feel confident enough to fight, would you want um, testing in place? Like, would you like to see some extra precautions? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely like uh, some extra screening. That would be that would be good. I mean, I don't know if they have the testing to to like give you immediate results yet, or how they could do that, but. But, yeah, I mean, you know, we're going to have fighters traveling from all over the place to, to to come to one area, and then we're going to be staying in hotels and going through airports. So it's, it's definitely scary. And, you know, like I've heard uh, infants and young, healthy people are dying now. So if, my, if I'm, like, cutting weight, I know my immune system is going to be compromised. Definitely not something I want to do to myself and then expose other people to it if I if someone were to get it or if I were to get it. So, I mean, um, I'm, I'm staying hopeful, but I am also doubtful that everything will happen by May 16th, you know? Absolutely, and it makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, I've talked to a few fighters. I think you have probably the most... I would say, like, mature standpoint on it. You know, I think yours makes a lot of sense from the non-fighter perspective. I, I think you have a very clear mindset about this pandemic. Um, now, this fight is scheduled to happen at featherweight. it would be making a move down to 145. I know you've done the cut before. Um, can you kind of talk about your decision to go down to 145 and uh, how you think it's going to help your career? So, I mean... I think I was always a featherweight to begin with. Uh, I missed weight my first UFC fight, so they made they had made me move up to 55. And then at 55, you know, I, I was doing okay, but like I really believed I was fighting out of my weight class. Every time I get in there, the guy's always bigger than me, taller, you know, longer reach. Um, and once once you fight at the level I was fighting at, like my last fight, for instance, so. I fought Oliveira. I fought uh, Diego Ferreira. Both of those guys are on six or seven fight win streaks at at Thunder, at, uh, at uh, lightweight. Uh, my one loss, my other loss to Silva in a fight that I was clearly winning. You know, I tore my hamstrings and I wound up losing. Got fight of the night, uh, and then I fought Dan Moret, who I beat, who was like six foot or six foot one, way bigger than me. I mean, every time I get in there, these guys are bigger than me. So, you know, I was just fighting out of my weight class. And once once you add size and really good technical ability, like all these guys have, it gets really hard to, to get an advantage, you know. So I think featherweight's my natural weight class. I definitely size up better with those guys. So I think, you know, everything happens for a reason. You know, I have some some tough fights and some, I had some ups and I had some downs at lightweight, but I think at featherweight, I definitely have a better, a better shot at being successful, you know? Uh, absolutely. And, uh, happy you've made a decision that, you know, for your career that you're happy and comfortable with. And I can't wait to see you at, at 45. Um, now 
to kind of go away from you and talk about what's really, really hot latest. Um, and I know you talked to TSN Aaron Bronster about this. Um, but when you see what we've seen this week and you would think that it'd be very hard for some people to get into trouble. Um, we got the news about John Jones once again. Uh, you so, you're someone who I know is sober now and had addiction in the past. When you saw this headline, never mind how you feel about John, the fighter, or you know whatever the case may be, as someone who has overcome addiction, and, and, and I know you, you fight that fight every single day, and you've inspired a lot of people doing it, but when you just see the news, you as a person, what was your first reaction? Um, I mean, I really wasn't surprised because, um, you know, John has a history of of getting in trouble. So, uh, coupled with, you know, drinking and uh, if he does other drugs, I mean, he's been called with cocaine in his system apparently. Um, you know, that and that makes trouble. So, I wasn't surprised. I mean. It sucks to see that happen to him because he has, you know, his his legacy is amazing and he's the, you know, one of the best fighters ever. So uh, I think he just needs real help. Like, going to rehab is one thing, you know, and abiding by, by the law is another thing, but working with someone who who is sober and has, experience in getting sober is another thing and I I feel like that's something he hasn't done probably is work with people who are who are the same as him like me or someone else that is in recovery um, I think he needs to work with someone that's gone through the same stuff and has dealt with the same things that he is dealing with and actually get real help instead of just like it's like going to rehab is is that's that's treatment like that's just separating yourself from the drugs and alcohol, but continuing to do work outside of treatment in everyday life is another thing. So I, I think that's what he needs. And, you know, he's got to just reach the bottom finally. And, and, uh, he needs to be willing, obviously. And, uh, I think that's where, what he's missing is the actual work with another alcoholic that can show him, you know, how to stay sober. For those that, you know, not even, this is not related to John um, specifically, but when you talk about, you know, not just going to rehab, but doing things every single day to, to get over, you know, their, their current struggles, what can people do who are in this position to keep them away from any struggles or demons? Well, for me it's, and for other alcoholics that I know, it's you know it's about spirituality and you know like knowing who you are and uh, dealing with your demons. Um, it's not like drugs and alcohol are just a symptom of what's going on inside of you. You know, people drink and drug to self-medicate, so that means that something else is wrong. So they have to figure out what it is that's truly you know, uh, giving them these problems. So, um, I think it's about being spiritually fit and dealing with your anxiety, dealing with your fears, uh, dealing with things from the past. Um, and, and then, uh, practicing certain principles that will keep you in line with your goal. So I think, uh, you know, anyone that's having, you have to, you have to look inside, you know, and see what's going on inside before you can stop, you know, drinking or drugging. So I think it's all about spirituality and, and being in contact with like whatever your higher power is. And, um, I think that's, the, I think that's like the main issue for a lot of people. Now, I'm not going to steal the question that uh, Aaron Bronstetter asked you about, you know, what people who are struggling can do during a, a rough time like this. I would encourage everyone to listen to your answer that Aaron Bronstetter posted, but let's have some fun with it. What shows, movies, or indoor, in-home activities does Jared Gordon recommend for everyday people like myself? Just don't tell me to get down the treadmill. 
Um, I was gonna say work out. <laughs> um, I mean, reading is is a big one. You know, instead of just which I have a huge problem with, um, like staring staring at my phone is a huge problem for me. I'm definitely addicted to my phone, and it's it's like my phone causes me anxiety and fucking all sorts of problems because I'm just comparing myself to others and. You know, it's like a huge form of uh, it's a huge form of depression for me. Also, so I think reading and you know doing other things like studying whatever you want to study, and um, I think those are big things. Like meditating could be one thing that you could do. Uh, you, you know, any form of like breathing exercises, yoga exercises, like. Anything to keep you away from your phone and and Netflix is uh is it maybe listening to podcasts or even listening to like audio books is good also. Um, but man, it's so hard to it's so hard to stay busy in times like this because we're so bored, you know. So anything to keep you outside of staring at your phone is probably healthy. But you know, it's hard for me to practice what I preach because I've been struggling with looking at my phone I've just been staring at it my fiance hates me for it <laughs> well yeah see without saying it and I'm just going to say you said it uh, you mentioned podcasts so it's it's stuff like this like you have to listen to Inside the Cage um, you have to listen to Jared Gordon you have to listen to all the other episodes I do like if you need podcast recommendations let's start here um, do you now okay I know you said no Netflix no no phone all that because it can be toxic for a lot of people. But do you have any TV show recommendations? Um, a Tiger King show is really strange. I was doing, <laughs> but it's but it's really short. Um, I didn't really get that much out of it. I thought it was just crazy. A bunch of weird, a bunch of weird ass people. Um, uh, Ozark. I heard it's really good. I'm going to start that tonight, I think, later it's very on. good. I haven't seen this this season, but it's very, very I good. Haven't started the, I haven't even started the first season, so I'm going to get on that. Um, we've been walking, watching The Walking Dead. That The next episode premieres tonight. I didn't really like it at first, but I kind of got into it. Um, that's all I got for you right now. Uh, I, was wait, I was waiting for the classic. I thought you were definitely going to mention uh, Sopranos. Oh, well, man, that's a given. I, everybody knows about my soprano history. and I'm, I'm a huge mafia, mob, mob uh, movie, mob documentary buff. Like, any mob or mafia documentary movie is, is a given. Last night I was watching Serpico, actually, uh, with, with uh, Al Pacino. Yeah, that was yeah. a fucking great movie. Um, I also watched that movie with Kevin Hart, uh, the Upside. Yeah, it's a very good movie. That was a fucking good movie. Um, what did you think of The Irishman when it came out? Oh, I loved it. I watched it like six times, actually. Um, if you don't know the backstory and if you don't know, like, all the, the short, you know, the, the figures in the movie, like, you know, like, uh, Joe, what was his name? Joe Gallo. And, yeah, yeah. Um, like, if you didn't know who all these guys were, then, like, it's kind of hard for you to, like, really enjoy it. But, uh, like, uh, there are so many underlying scenes in that movie that, you know, happened in real life. And all these guys are real people. And it's, it was, I thought it was fucking great. I loved it. That's great. That's awesome stuff. So, all right, because I'm, oh, please don't criticize me too much for this. And I'm, I'm going to get ready to let you go here. Um, so, I started watching The Sopranos. Got, like, two episodes in. And then I started getting ready to move out to Jersey. So I was watching it when I was in Chicago. I've been so busy ever since that I really haven't had much time to binge watch a lot of things. Realistically, if all I'm doing is writing, eating, using the bathroom every once in a while, and watching The Sopranos while I'm writing and doing all my other stuff, how quickly do you think I could get done with the series? Well, there's six episodes, I mean, six seasons. I think Wait, six seasons. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's six. But there's like 
it was like 15, 20 episodes in each season. Something like that. So it's going to take so me a little bit. It definitely takes a while. But, man, you could watch it fairly quick. Probably like two, three weeks if you really go at it. Um, this is the perfect time, man. The time is now. <laughs> I love it. I'll, I'll definitely get on it. And, uh, Jared, I, I know the status of your fight is up, you know, in the air right now. Hopefully on a more important level, uh, this pandemic slows down and we can all get back to our normal daily lives i think there's a lot of people um who are out there going they never realized how bad they actually wanted to go to work for the first time in their life um but i do think it's a wake-up call for society and uh i'm hoping that all of us and uh come out the other side of this you know with a better mindset better attitude towards life um but again i hope i hope it's over soon and we can get back to uh business as usual and we could see you fight in may if not I know uh, I know. we'll see you fight sooner rather than later. Uh, thank you for this conversation. It, it's been a lot of fun, and uh, hope we can talk again soon. All right, Mike. Thanks. That was Jared Gordon, UFC former lightweight, now headed down to featherweight. A lot of good stuff. Um, let me let me clarify one thing. I don't know, and it's not my place to say whether or not John Jones has any issues. If you have noticed on social media, I haven't commented on it. I don't care to comment on it. I was just curious, as John has had multiple run-ins, what a guy like Jared Gordon makes of all of that. Some people think think it's addiction. Some people think he just lives John Jones's life. At the end of the day, I'm not here to to cast, you know, criticism on anyone. I'm not here to judge anyone. Um, this is a, a show about fighters and uh, the people that they are. So I, I want to tell the story, but sometimes the chapters are, are the chapters that are written are, aren't going to be the best chapters. I mean, we're all readers here, some of us, right? You read a book as a kid, maybe you didn't like chapter 3, but maybe you loved chapter 7. So this is a chapter in John Jones' story. But what we fail to realize in the world of professional sports is that chapter is so short. If John Jones lives to be 89 years old, the fighting chapters of his life will only be about 20 years. If that. You, I'm counting amateur and professional and his rise to the UFC. You know. It's, it's not the longest time in the world. It's not, it's not your entire lifespan. So I, I think John Jones is, is a good person. I, I, think, I think John needs to just do this for him, whatever this thing is that he needs to do. Um, incredibly talented his superstar power is tremendous, but at the end of the day, you, you saw the video with the police running, he talked about his family, and I think just putting faith and family first back into his life on a, on a consistent basis, I think that's what it's going to take. It's almost like this pandemic, it's not about ourselves anymore, it's about those around us. But I'm wishing John Jones all the best. I don't. I don't even know if this affects his UFC career. Um, I don't even know if it's gonna hurt his legal career, you know, or you know, his personal life, his legal career. He doesn't have a legal career, but you know, from a legal standpoint, I don't know if it's gonna affect him. MMA fighting did a a, a story recently, uh, talking to a defense attorney, and and you know, they said like, hey, like, with this pandemic, we're not sure. So John could avoid everything here. But to those of you criticizing and ridiculing John Jones, you're not perfect. You, you notice why I don't speak up? I'm not perfect. Who am I? Who am I to cast judgment on John Jones? Not for me. Not my place. It's not my place to do so. It's not my style to do so. I would like to see John Jones never get in trouble again, as would a lot of people. But this is about John, John's family. And his personal life. So I don't think any of us can tell John Jones what to do. And I don't think it's fair for us to talk about things that we don't know about. So 
On that note, big thank you to Jared Gordon for joining me. This is Inside the Cage on BJPenn.com. I am Mike Pendleton. You can follow me on Twitter at MP2310. On Instagram at MikeP2310 as well. Plenty more coming your way. We just started this last week. And by the time this one is up, this will be episode five. Come on now. More and more coming your way in the near future. Keep it locked here. BJPenn.com. BJPenn.com's YouTube. And uh, all that and more. Again, this is Mike Pendleton. And as always, until next time, we'll see you soon, everybody.